Active Directory Certificate Services, Part 1. In this nugget, we're talking about Active Directory Certificate Services. This is a pretty big topic, so it's going to require more than one part. So this is only the first part of it. And then we're going to talk about, in this particular nugget, certificate uses. Most of them revolve around security, and they can deal with things such as signing, encryption, anything else like that that you may have heard of in the past. And then we'll also talk about the PKI hierarchy. Uh, there's a certain strategy that you can configure, and I have kind of a serving suggestion diagram. There's certainly many variations of that uh, than compared to what I'll show you here. But it's a really good starting point in terms of understanding the PKI hierarchy. We'll also take a look at the difference between a standalone uh, certificate authority and an enterprise certificate authority because there's certainly big differences there. The key there is enterprise is also uh, Active Directory capable. And then we'll actually do an installation of a certificate authority to kind of get ourselves used to how it looks and feels and then we'll start to work with the specific aspects of a CA starting in our next nugget. Now before we get started talking about certificate authorities, we ought to first establish why we even need certificates. One of the things you can use certificates for is signatures. For example, you can do code signing. If you have some VB script, some PowerShell, something like that, you can assign a signature to it using your certificate that validates that it's definitely from you, that you've never changed it, and it's never been modified. So it's code signing is one of the reasons for that. Closely associated, that would be signed at drivers. Similarly, we can confirm that when we install a driver that's signed, that it's not been tampered with or modified since the original manufacturer of that driver created it. In fact, as kind of a quick side note, 64-bit versions of Windows Vista require signed drivers. And Windows Server 2008 also, of course, uh, is going to work best with signed drivers as well. And then we also have email purposes. Uh, this is very useful. I have a, a corporate client of mine that's a large insurance company in New York. And with one of the contractors that I work with, we are required to send and receive signed and encrypted email to one another. Uh, so we can confirm that, yes, the message really did come from me, no, it was not tampered with, and even if somebody did intercept it somehow, they wouldn't be able to make any sense of it without the corresponding certificate, the constituent parts of a certificate. There's also tokens that are involved. Uh, this can be very useful in signing as well. And in fact, we use that uh, kind of beneath the scenes. We didn't really explore it a lot. Uh, but when we use Federation services, those messages that are sent back and forth, especially when we have a confirmed authentication that comes back from an account federation, well, it's going to sign that token with its digital signature to confirm that it wasn't some imposter that signed that token instead, claiming to be somebody that they really weren't. We have server messages in a number of different ways here as well. Even in some ordinary Windows traffic, there can be signed, uh, certain signed data that transpires on the wire. We look at some more specifics here. For example, one of those is Internet. Now, it doesn't have to be a Microsoft thing, but you know that you can use HTTPS, the HTTPS protocol, over a secure socket layer and, or transport layer security, and all of that is uh, encrypted. It can also be signed. All of that stuff is very, very secure, but it's because of the certificates that we have at our disposal. We also have the ability to encrypt data. This could be just network data, for example, uh, network data such as this type of data, the SSL data, or you could use IPsec, or you might just want to encrypt local files, such as using the encrypting file system. Uh, this could be signed and encrypted, rather, using using local certificates that are self-signed certificates that a local machine will generate on its own and administer by itself, or they could be certificates that have been uh, issued by a certificate authority. And of course, that'd be the better solution because then you can also configure it so you have a backup in Active Directory and things. And then we have wireless uses for this as well. Uh, we can confirm then that our data is encrypted while it's in transit over the airwaves. Now, there are other ways of doing that, other wireless uh, technologies that have some capability, but some of them definitely are weak in terms of their overall encryption and they're easily cracked. And so if we use certificates, it's going to be much, much more difficult to crack. Also, you can use smart cards. That looks like guard, but it's supposed to be a smart card. And these are just credit card sized devices that will have a, a, a little kind of a chip on them right here. It's got gold contacts on it usually and it's you know, often got kind of a number sign looking symbol on it. And these are things that will store a public and private key for an individual user. That, that user can then use that smart card to either open doors or to uh, unlock their computer or to log on to their computer. And then they might have to enter in also a 
series of numbers, you know, like a PIN, for two-factor authentication. So they have to have both the smart card, that's one factor, and a PIN or something that they know, and that's the second factor of the authentication. So here's just kind of a short list of different uses for certificates. And I also must point out before we start here that just having certificates is no guarantee of security because it still depends upon the weakest link in the security chain, and that is the human factor. Uh, for example, a few months back, I heard my wife doing something on her phone, pushing the keys and all of that stuff, and pretty soon I received a text message on my cell phone down in my office. Well, she was just upstairs when she was doing this, and I could hear her actually typing on her cell phone. I thought, why don't you just call down to me? I could have heard you, you know. But anyway, I get this message, and it says, what's the uh, username and password to our online banking? Well, she's certainly entitled that information, so I started to reply, and then it occurred to me, why don't I just talk? like real humans used to do way back in the olden days. So I started walking up the stairs, and I went into her office. She's got a, an office upstairs. And uh, I said, hey, what's going on? And she said, well, I received this email. And it says that it's from Bank of America, which is where we bank. And it says your account has been blocked. And I know what she was thinking. Great Scott, the debit card might be frozen, and I won't be able to go shopping. <laughs> so I, uh, I took a look at this, and it has a click, of course, here. So we, she clicked on that already, and it took her to this web page, which, great, Scott, that does look exactly like our online banking for Bank of America. And we're supposed to select a location and enter your online ID, and later on it would ask for a password. Well, it, it looks secure, because what have we always told our users? You always look for this HTTPS. Okay, that means it's got a, a encryption, and it's secure, and it uses a certificate. That's what the padlock also indicates right there. So we know that we're perfectly secure in entering all this information, right? Well, not necessarily. <laughs> you see, this was a certificate that was issued by a legitimate certificate authority, a public CA out there on the Internet, and they're part of Microsoft's chain of trust certificates. I don't know how they were able to get this because, of course, this is definitely a phishing attempt. In fact, it's not even actually Bank of America. It's whatever that is right there. And uh, the last time I went to try to check this out, this site was no longer working. Uh, so apparently Bank of America did chase it down. Actually, I did report it, so maybe that's you know, part of what happened there. Uh, but again, just having certificates by itself is not necessarily enough to guarantee security. It still depends upon the weakest link in the security chain, which, of course, is my wife. Uh, I, mean the, I mean the human factor. So as we look at a PKI infrastructure here, I just want to give you an overall scope for what this might look like in most small to, or rather, medium to large organizations. Uh, they're probably going to have a multi-tiered architecture. Sometimes they don't have all three tiers, but they may have two tiers at the very least. What goes on with this is, in our PKI, which is a, a public key infrastructure, we have a root CA. Its only purpose in life is to issue certificates to these two certificate authorities in the infrastructure that we see here. And all the computers you see here are all certificate authority servers. So it issues certificates to these two computers. And why does it do that? Uh, the purpose of this is so that these certificate authorities in turn can issue certificates to these certificate authorities down here. And then we'll be able to trace the chain back up to this root CA. If this root CA has its certificate installed in the trusted root certification authorities store of all of our clients, then that means that all the users and computers that receive certificates from any of these certificate authorities down here will automatically trust those certificates because it says we know that it came from this root CA. So in other words, anything that can trace its lineage back to a root CA that we trust, we will trust anything that it issues. I'll trust anything that this certificate authority issues, anything that any of these other certificate authorities uh, issue because I trust this root. Uh, now, the root CA's only job is to issue basically these two certificates. One to each certificate authority at the next or the intermediate level there. Once they have received their certificates, their only job is to issue certificates to these certificate authorities. Once the root CA and these intermediate CAs have done their job, more, than, more often than not, we take those offline. Uh, very often we'll put those in virtual machines so that they're not actually even on their own physical dedicated hardware. But we'll t uh, do that. We'll have them issue the certificates they're responsible for, and then we'll archive them, possibly by taking them even off the hard drive, 
putting putting them on DVDs or other removable media where they can be stored, putting them in a very highly secured safe. You'll put these in the highest level of physical security that you have available to you. And then you may never even see these again for the rest of your career. <laughs> um, it could be years before you break these out again. Now, for these intermediate levels, it might only be five years, uh, but for the root CA, it could be 20 years before it's needed again. Uh, so it's it's a long, long time before uh, these come out of that, that cold, dark safe. And the reason why we take these offline and put them in a cold, dark safe is because we want to protect the security. You see, if I leave this online and then, you know, if I leave these online and then some hacker figures out a way to get through my firewalls and my intrusion detection systems and everything else, or I have a malicious employee that somehow poisons my root CA, then what would happen is they could compromise all the certificates that were issued then. Because if they compromise this root CA, then that means that all of these child certificates that were issued throughout my hierarchy could all be potentially compromised in terms of their security. So I want to take it offline so that it takes away the availability of it so that it can't be hacked. And then what happens is, you know, once these are all you know, offline, uh, then if I have maybe just one certificate authority that it gets hacked, maybe it's this one right here, then I will have to rebuild that one, reissue certificates, reissue certificates to all my web servers in this case, but it does not affect IPsec, it doesn't affect my, it doesn't affect my smart card users, it doesn't affect my email and EFS or my user certificates, it doesn't affect any of the rest of these, only this web server will have to be rebuilt, and that's why we very often use this three-tiered architecture. Now, if you're in a medium organization, uh, or not too large of an organization, you may eliminate this middle level here and go straight from a root CA uh, that issues certificates to the, these four CAs down here. Also, you don't have to split it up exactly like I've got. Now, you could put all of these roles for certificates on a single certificate authority. But once again, by spreading apart the responsibility from one CA to the next, I limit the scope of damage if one of them gets compromised like this web server that I mentioned, uh, or this web uh, certificate authority that I mentioned. Another thing to realize with this is that in this kind of a hierarchy, we're going to have kind of a dividing line here. And anything that's above this dividing line are going to be, uh, going to be standalone certificate authorities. Okay? This means that they're not a member of the domain, and as a result of that, not much is automated. Uh, they don't have their certificates automatically in, uh, put into Active Directory, and they normally just are never there in Active Directory. Uh, they don't have the ability to do things like auto-enrollment so that we can automatically distribute certificates to our clients. A lot of disadvantages in that. However, we don't normally want these to be a member of the domain because since we're going to you know, lock these up in a closet and they're going to be powered off or uh, just sitting around possibly for years at a time, it wouldn't make any sense to make them a member of a domain because normally a computer needs to renew its a computer password with the domain controller every 30 days and if I don't bring these out for two three four five years well their passwords already long expired and they're not not a member of the domain anymore anyway anything on the other hand that is an issuing CA like these down here that you know possibly daily issue certificates to my users and computers uh, these are going to be called uh, enterprise enterprise CAs and that doesn't necessarily uh, mean that they have to be the enterprise edition. That's just a term indicating that they're members of a domain. I thought they probably could have come up with a term that gave more indication of domain membership, but that's what we have. These will be uh, online constantly for high availability because we always want them to be able to issue a certificate just in case somebody's certificate's about to expire and it gets renewed automatically, something like that. We want it to always be available. And here I want to discuss with you a little bit more about the differences here. Now, I don't think that, uh, first of all, I don't think that this diagram uh, and the mu much of the things that I've told you so far, as well as these specific bullet points for these things are necessarily important parts of the exam. However, it's a little bit more difficult to explain some of the other things I'll do a little bit later on if you don't already have some understanding of this. But what I'm telling you is you don't have to you know, memorize this or anything like that. Okay, first of all, a standalone CA. What are its characteristics? Number one, no Active Directory. So it's not a member of Active Directory, as I mentioned earlier. Any requests that you issue to the standalone CA, if you want a certificate, are going to have to be manual cer certificate requests. You'll have to supply the information, and then there will normally be pending requests that someone, another administrator, uh, will have to go into the certificate authority 
find the pending request, and then right-click on it, and then choose Issue before that certificate is actually released to whoever requested it. Also, you don't have any certificate templates that can be managed. I'll talk to more about that in a moment because basically templates are something that you can customize for your own purposes uh, in terms of what a certificate purpose is. Also, they, the manually install, you, use, you manually install these standalone certificate authorities certificates in the user's trusted root. And this is why we want to do this back with our root CA, for example. We want to make sure that this root CA is certificate because it will generate its own certificate. Uh, it's just that since it doesn't have a, a parent CA of its own, it's already at the top, then it does a self-signed certificate here instead. And I'll just put another certificate looking thing on there. Looks more like a little girl in a dress. But anyway, it's a, <laughs> it's, I guess I could make it like this. But anyway, it's supposed to be a certificate right here that this root CA gets. Um, and that is self-signed. Remember, this certificate has to be installed in anybody else that I want to be able to trust that certificate implicitly. Okay. So, now let's go ahead and take a look at some other things with this. Um, the standalone CA, normally, it's only going to be reserved for your root certificate authorities or subordinate certificate authorities. And I've explained that already in the diagram that I showed you a few moments ago. Now, with an enterprise CA, you're going to have to make those certificate authorities members of Active Directory. That's what makes them enterprise CAs. As a result of doing that, you'll be able to use something like auto-enrollment. Now, the reason why is because auto-enrollment will be able to supply the information that was manually supplied over here on a standalone CA. That can be automatically supplied using data that appears in Active Directory for my user account, for example. Also, with an enterprise CA, I can use it to issue smart cards or token-based authentication. Uh, they both really do the same thing. Uh, and you can kind of take your pick depending upon expense and so forth, and it's a little bit outside of our scope here. But a smart card, like I said, is a credit card-sized device with a little chip on it containing your, uh, your certificate. Well, this, the, that basically comes down to being token-based authentication. You can also have other devices that do the same thing as a smart card. They're like USB dongles. They're about the size of a thumb drive. Sometimes they can double as a thumb drive. They may also have a, a token on there that has your public and private key on it and your certificate. So either one of these can be used for authentication um, and for logon and the like. Also, with an enterprise CA, your certificates and your revoked certificates are going to be published to Active Directory. So this gives you a high level of availability because any place where you have an Active Directory domain controller will have a copy of the certificate and a copy of any revoked certificates so that you can make sure that no certificates that are actually invalid will be accepted by anybody. Also, uh, and by the way, a revoked certificate is a certificate that has been, uh, that's been invalidated on purpose by human intervention, by an IT administrator somewhere, because the, the certificate might have been compromised or the employee quit or, or reasons like that. Certificates eventually will expire on their own, and you don't really need to do anything with those expired certificates uh, because they're already invalid. Revoked certificates are made invalid before their expiration. Also, with an enterprise CA, we'll have type 2 certificates. The inf significance of that is that you can create security templates off of those and copy templates, so that or uh, duplicate templates is actually what we call that. And then you can customize the purpose of them. And then type 3 templates are new with Windows Server 2008, and they're only compatible with Windows Server 2008 and Windows Vista. They're just like two templates, except that they add additional levels of security, higher levels of encryption, and so forth. Uh, also, with an enterprise CA, you can have, like I said, automatically filled in requests, which is very similar to what I was telling you about in auto-enrollment, where it can automatically fill in data that appears from Active Directory. So let's go ahead and take a look at how we can actually install and work with a certificate authority. And I'm going to use a simple environment here. Later on, when I do another video series, uh, that's the 70-647 series, this relates a lot more to network infrastructure. Then we're going to go through the whole PKI in terms of the, the root and the intermediate and all the different layers of that. For simplicity's sake, for our current purposes, I'm going to install a certificate authority here on this particular server. It doesn't have any other roles installed right now, but it's going to be both the root server and it's going to be the enterprise server. So it's going to be Active Directory integrated. And you can see, if let me go back up here, you can see that it is a member of the domain, which it has to be if I want to make it 
uh, if I want to make an Active Directory integrated uh, and an enterprise server. So I'm going to click on Add Roles over here. It's very simple. And uh, when we get to this, it's going to launch the wizard, which we've seen many times. So I'm going to select Certificate Services and then click Next. And then we get some rudimentary information here telling us that we should not rename this computer once we've installed the role. The reason for that is because the name of the computer is included in a lot of metadata about this server. And if we rename the server, it gets out of sync in terms of its naming and could cause some real problems. Here we're going to specify that we want this to be a certification authority and we want to install the certification authority web enrollment role. We don't really have to have it for purposes of my demonstration, uh, but it's just something that's very commonly also included. And then we could also include the online responder. This is a new feature of Server 2008 that allows us to check the validity of certificates to see whether or not they've been revoked. And it's more efficient than using something that we've used in the past called the certificate revocation list. Now we still use a certificate revocation list, or CRL, or as I call it, just a CRIL, but the online responder is a great add-on to that, which is going to help speed things up a bit. And then there's the network device enrollment service, which allows us to add certificates to low-level operating systems that appear on certain network devices, such as routers and switches. That way we can be sure that when we communicate with those routers and switches, since they now have their own certificate, signatures can be generated, which can allow us to validate that that router or switch really is indeed my router or switch, and that an imposter has not plugged in their own equipment into my network, and you know maybe redirected network traffic to their own malicious location. We don't need any of those right now, but I will use the online responder here in a little while. Now, as I mentioned before, this computer is a member of the domain, so I could make this an enterprise CA. I could also manually opt to, to make it a standalone CA if I want to. Now, the difference here is if this computer were a member only of uh, a work group and not a member of the domain, then the enterprise option would be grayed out, and I would not be able to select it. It would be forcing me onto the standalone. But as a member of the domain, I can choose enterprise, which is what I'm going to do here. And then this is where you choose the root or subordinate CA. In other words, this is where you select you know, whether it's this or whether it's this within your particular hierarchy. I'm choosing it to be the root CA. And then I want to create a new private key or use an existing private key. I'm going to choose create a new private key because I've not installed certificate authority services on this, on this particular computer for our purposes uh, in the past. So if it had been a computer that Oh, you know, maybe it was a CA in the past and the computer failed or the hard drive died out or something and we had a private key stored elsewhere that we'd archived, then I could use that existing private key and install it here. And then for all other practical intents and purposes, this would be the same certificate authority as, you know, the one that died. Uh, and in terms of uh, my PKI, all my other CAs would see this as the original CA. But in my case, we're going to create a new private key and then here we can choose what kind of cryptographic service provider we want to use. Normally, you'll stick with the RSA, Microsoft St Software Key Storage Provider. You could also use other methods here as well. Some of these will be hardware providers instead, such as smart card uh, storage providers. And if you install uh, other cryptographic service providers from companies like Schlumberger or Gem Plus or maybe other smart card reader companies, they will then probably automatically include in here additional CSPs that we don't see right now. And then the other thing we do here is select the hash algorithm for signing certificates issued by the CA. The most common one is probably going to be SHA-1. It is pretty strong. Uh, in previous versions of Windows Server 2000, whatever, uh, 2003, 2000, uh, we had SHA-1 is pretty much the strongest one unless we choose a different cryptographic service provider. Now you can see that we can go a lot stronger. We could go up to SHA-512 which is extremely, uh, extremely tight. I'm going to stay with the default values for now, but just keep in mind that the more security sensitive the server, normally the higher level of an of a algorithm that you want to use there. And you can also increase the character, uh, the key character length as well. So if this was really a root CA in a highly sensitive organization, I might choose a longer key length with a more complex signature algorithm. Then I can also use the prong, strong private key protection. And this means, though, that I would have to manually intervene every time I tried to access the private key on this CA. And then here we just have some naming information. You don't have to change any of this. It's just the name that's going to appear and how it's going to be identified within Active Directory, for example. That's why it has a distinguished name suffix that appears here. And then we specify the validity period for this CA. 
Now, uh, probably an intermediate CA is going to be more like to between two and three years, maybe five. A root CA, if you use the strongest levels of encryption and so forth, you could make this a decade. This could be even 20 years. Uh, because uh, basically, the stronger the encryption, the longer you can leave, the, leave it alone, basically. Because the stronger the encryption, the more time it would take for somebody to be able to hack it anyway. And by the way, so far, nobody's ever been able to successfully create a direct hack on certificates and be able to find private keys or any of that kind of thing. So doing pretty good so far. Normally, also, you can put the database and database location itself and the log on different hard drives. I only have the one hard drive, but in a production environment that's, that's busy especially, you're going to want to put it elsewhere, and that would probably be a best practice. Also because if the operating system drive fails for some reason, at least you still have the database and log locations. Now, then we need to go ahead and install the web server. You don't have to pick and choose the different components of IIS because it's been automatically selected by our choice of uh, using this as a uh, as a certificate of authority uh, for online enrollment. So we're just going to go ahead and next past all the options that it gives us here. And then we just click install and wait for it to happen. Okay, so the wizard finishes, and then I had to close server manager and open it up again in order to be able to see the roles properly here for Active Directory certificate services and to be able to access any of the additional nodes that appear down here. Now, before we move on, I want to point out something else. Let me go back to my computer properties here. And by looking at this, we'll see that we're working with Windows Server Data Center Edition. The significance of that is that both Data Center and Enterprise Edition give me the ability to work with certificate templates and to create duplicates of those templates. Here we have in Active Directory Certificate Services a number of certificate templates that are already available. And these templates are very useful for doing things such as auto-enrollment. We'll look at a lot of the purposes for these certificate templates in our next nugget. In this nugget, we took a look at Active Directory Certificate Services this was part one. We took a look, first of all, at certificate uses. Remember, it's almost always just security related, really, to verify the identity of a host, for example, or to sign code or sign email, encrypt documents, that sort of thing. All of that comes out of a PKI, PKI hierarchy. Normally, you're, for example, remember your root CA is going to be a standalone CA that you can take offline as soon as you uh, meet its needs and as soon as you issue a certificate from it to your intermediate CAs, which are also taken offline, and then you're issuing CA are normally always online and highly available. Uh, we, so we took a look at the hierarchy there, and that's just a serving suggestion. People do it different ways, but that's a starting point. Then we took a look at the differences between a standalone CA and an enterprise CA. Remember, the difference here is that an enterprise CA uses active, <laughs> active Directory, and so therefore, when it generates certificates, it can pull information out of Active Directory and then save information into Active Directory as well, such as an archived copy of a certificate. Then we took a look at actually doing an installation of a CA, which is a good starting point as we move on into our next, uh, next nugget, where we'll talk about working with certificate templates. Well, I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing.